You've had a rough day, you're exhausted, you just want to have a little drink at the end of your intermittent fasting day. Are you completely sabotaging everything that you worked for that day? We're going to break down what's happening inside your body if you have alcohol after breaking a fast. So the first thing I need to address is that when you look at a lot of these studies that demonstrate that a moderate amount of alcohol can actually increase your lifespan, <laughs> It's not the most realistic thing to look at. And I'm not anti-alcohol at all. I'm just coming out and saying that these studies are generally observational. So they're usually not looking at the full like mechanism in which why people might live longer or not live as long. And there's something called abstainer's bias. So remember this. When you look at data that shows that, oh, this person didn't drink and they didn't live as long, so drinking must help make people live longer. Well, they forget the fact that a lot of times people that don't drink, that are included in these studies, are people that had drank a lot before and had already done the damage to their liver. And then during the time of the study, they were just sober. So that's not real data to show that you know, not drinking is going to make you live longer or live less, right? It's just skewed. Point is, is that we have to look at mechanisms and make a decision for ourselves. So diving right in, one of the big benefits that you get out of fasting is something called autophagy that cellular recycling, okay? Now, if you are fasting because you're trying to change your body composition, alcohol after breaking a fast is probably not something you wanna be doing, you don't wanna be having. And it has to do with the fact that alcohol inhibits autophagy at the hepatic level. See, the Journal of Medical Science has found that once people had consumed alcohol, autophagy at the liver level tended to slow down and even stop in some cases. That's not exactly what we want because when we're trying to preserve muscle, which is a huge part of fasting, right? Huge part of our body composition change, autophagy is going to break down components of cells to allow the release of amino acids that actually feed our muscles and keep muscle on us while we're fasting. If we slow down the rate of autophagy, then we slow down how efficiently that process happens and we run the risk of burning up some of our muscle while we're fasting. Does that mean you never have alcohol? No, it means that you definitely exercise moderation and you probably want to not drink after longer fasts, anything over like 18 hours or so. What's interesting is that they've also found that it downregulates muscle autophagy, which again is a very important thing because the muscle autophagy is essentially the muscle breakdown that occurs during a fast. Now, you might be thinking, wait a minute, I thought you said it preserves muscle. Well, the proper muscle breakdown is very important because what that does is that breaks down the weaker components of muscle so that after the fast, when you do eat, you repair that with more quality muscle. So in essence, fasting can kind of create higher quality muscle. Well, if you're drinking a lot, it can get disrupted, which leads me into kind of this next component, which is the energy during a fast. Okay, a lot of the energy that we are getting during a fast is coming from ketone production. Ketones provide us with the energy during a fast because we don't have any other fuel sources at hand. Well, it turns out that alcohol blunts ketone formation. And it does this in the way that, well, alcohol converts into something called acetaldehyde, which is very, very toxic to the body, and it's the job of the liver to process it. Now, I'm not saying that alcohol is the most terrible thing on earth. I'm saying that your body's going to do what it has to do, and it's going to prioritize metabolizing that alcohol, that acetaldehyde. Well, this puts ketone production on the back burner. But that begs the question, does this really matter in the long term? because I'm not drinking during my fast, right? Because if drinking acutely stops ketone formation, then that should only be a problem if we were to take a guzzle during our actual fast, right? Wrong. You see, there is a longer stream process we have to look at too. Now, this is something I talk about a lot. It's called PPAR alpha, and the simplest way that I can explain it is it's kind of the master switch. Like PPAR alpha turns on all the different fatty acid oxidation processes and really just switches the gear for our body to start being in lack of a better term, fasting mode. So the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition found that alcohol consumption slowed down fatty acid oxidation. That's bad on one hand because yes, that slows down fat burning, so to speak, but it's bad because what happens kind of in a secondary fashion. If we slow down fatty acid oxidation, we slow down what is called PPAR alpha binding. So the journal Alcohol published that if you consumed alcohol, it slowed or even halted the binding of PPAR to the DNA. Now, if PPAR is the, ma the, the master switch to get us into a fasting state, if we stop it from binding to the DNA, 
then we are never really learning how to utilize the fat as a fuel source and we're never getting the benefit there. So there is a longer term effect. So short term, alcohol will stop ketone formation, but longer term, it kind of, I don't know, attenuates that metabolic switch a little bit. So again, you have to ask yourself, well, when can I drink in this case? I mean, the best case scenario is to probably drink after you haven't fasted for 36 to 48 hours, not that close to your fast. That way you're kind of separate, okay? It would almost be like fast during the week, have some fun with that, don't fast during the weekends, and if you're gonna drink, drink on the weekends and drink casually, don't drink a lot. Another thing that you might wanna consider is if you're like drinking on the weekends or anything like that, is snacking on like higher protein things because there's a relationship. The co-ingestion of alcohol and protein seems to sort of attenuate that muscle protein breakdown issue. It kind of helps it out a little bit. So if you were to drink on the weekends and things like that, you're better off to not necessarily combine it with a bunch of fats and not combine it with a bunch of starches and combine it with like protein snacks and I don't know, beef sticks, stuff like that that's going to help you kind of attenuate that message, not just from a digestive component, but also just from how the signaling works. Uh, if you wanna get some of the snacks that I recommend for this situation, but also just for keto and fasting in general, I put a link down below for Thrive Market. They're a big supporter of this channel. You've probably seen them on my channel a lot. There's a special link that way you can go and you can get like the types of foods that I would usually snack on during my eating period or the types of foods that I would snack on during a ketogenic diet. So highly, highly recommend it. They deliver it right to your doorstep, super easy. No more going to the grocery store. It can save you a bunch of money that way. And just thank you Thrive Market for supporting my fans, supporting my channel. There's a link down below for you to check out. So the other piece we have to look at that kind of builds this whole scope is like what, A, what alcohols do we drink, but B, like what about the inflammatory response? So we'll talk about the inflammatory response first and then I'll move into which alcohols to drink uh, that are gonna be a little bit better in this case. The large reason why we fast is to modulate inflammation. One of the reasons you feel so good when you fast is because of that modulation of inflammation. Now, when you break your fast, you have an increase in inflammation. It's just a normal thing that's gonna happen, right? You, you've been fasting, so you don't have any calories coming in, then all of a sudden you have some food. Even if it's clean, it's gonna trigger that spike in inflammation. Well, one of the ways that we kind of limit that a little bit is by reducing what are called lipopolysaccharides from getting into the bloodstream. So we do whatever we can to eat certain foods and do certain things. I've done videos on that. Well, unfortunately, alcohol increases serum levels of lipopolysaccharides. What those are, are pathogenic materials that live in our gut, that are supposed to be in our gut and supposed to stay in our gut. But sometimes through inflammatory responses, they leach through our gut and get into our bloodstream, and that triggers sort of an inflammatory immune response to sort of attack these things that aren't supposed to be there. I would say it's kind of a normal thing because it happens so much in our world, but it shouldn't be happening a ton. And alcohol increases those serum levels, which means it's gonna spike up that inflammatory response at the end of a fast. So why would you want to make it a higher response, right? So all stars and all things are aligning and pointing to saying, drinking after a fast is probably not a good thing. I don't know if it's unhealthier per se, but you're definitely reversing some of the signaling that you're trying to gain as far as like fat adaptation and everything like that, okay? Which leads me to like, what alcohol should you drink? Well, we've talked about when you should drink, okay, probably away from your fasting periods. But again, you wanna lean into like triple distilled vodka. You wanna lean as clean as possible. So vodka, whiskey, gin, things like that that are super clean. Stronger, uh, actual alcohols like that in more of a shot form, more of a liquor form, are going to be a lot better, believe it or not, than sipping on wine. Don't fool yourself into thinking that wine, because of the antioxidant profile, is going to be better. The amount of red wine you would have to consume to get the active resveratrol is ridiculous. So you'd have to consume so much more actual alcohol content to get the potential antioxidant effect than you would if you were to just consume some liquor. And also be weary of combining it with sweeteners. So if you're making drinks or anything like that, you might be having a sugar-free beverage, but there is still a level of hepatic involvement that comes in with artificial sweeteners, right? So sucralose, uh, aspartame, anything, okay? You have to be careful because that's putting the liver into hyper overdrive. Not only is it having to deal with alcohol, but it's also having to deal with an artificial sweetener. Oh, the other one that I wanna mention is be weary of combining them with like energy drinks and things like that. And the reason behind that is simply because of the distortion that can happen. It's, it's really, really difficult for the body to process kind of uh, one lobe of the brain that's kind of dealing with alcohol and another portion that's getting stimulated a little bit more by caffeine. So just be careful of that. It's usually not a good combination when it comes down to metabolic drivers. But again, 
in moderation, you're fine. If you're a wine drinker, it's not the end of the world. I'm not saying you have to switch to hard liquor. I'm just saying the minimal impact that we can have on the liver, the better, because it's gonna be less of an inflammatory response. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel, and I'll see you tomorrow.